Welcome to your student radio station, bringing you great shows. Good evening, welcome to the East Charming Men. The Jam Jar here, I'm Matilda and I'm Meg. You are listening to Bangs and Mash. This is going to be great. <laughs> oh my God. Great music. An era-defining band. A new single from Radiohead. Great interviews. Hi, this is Frank Turner. My name is uh, Sadiq Khan, I'm running through the Mayor of London. My name is Eddie Izzard. And keep up to date with the arts. A poet, a playwright and a cultural icon. He is, of course, William Shakespeare. News and politics. What about if the people are too stupid? Stupid though to make this decision. People make that decision. That's the entire point of a democracy. Sports. So close. He slipped through. He brings it through on his left foot. Just over the back of the net. And on campus coverage. When you think of Battle of the Bands, it just offers that real diversity. Welcome to the big decision. This is Varsity Rugby. And, and what a try! Dying moments of the game. Online and on 1251 AM. This is Raw. My name's Marion Mamazi and you're listening to Roar. I'm George Galloway and you're listening to Roar. It's Roar and it's fantastic. You are listening to Raw and its Perspectives this week, back for another week on your student radio station. This week on the panel, we have a few new guests for the first time in a while. We're usually stuck with the same old rubbish of Mike Wrench and Barnaby <laughs> Merrill, but we have upgraded this week. So on the panel, we have Jack Abbey, Dan Welsh, Gerard Jones, Emma Johnson, and your education SAB officer. For the time being, for a few more months now, a few more weeks, Charlie Heindhoff. Is that how you say it, Charlie? It's deceptively spelt. That's it, Heintoff. That's a, so, you know, Thanks for having me, Henry. I've, I've, I've nailed it there. Uh, coming up on the show this week, we have a load of things uh, being raised. We're talking about Owen Jones walking out of the Sky News interview, which was quite feisty if you didn't see it. Uh, we are also talking about where The Sun, rather, who have come out in support of Brexit. We'll also be talking about a few controversial tweets from Leave.eu, one of the campaigns uh, trying to get the UK to leave the EU. And finally, Sadiq Khan, who wants to ban, quote, body shaming adverts so a lot to feast your eyes upon this week but I think we'll start with our first topic that is Owen Jones uh, actually no not Owen Jones sorry media outlets uh, like the Sun so the Sun have come out in support of Brexit the headline reads we urge our readers to be leave great pun in Britain and vote to quit the EU on June the 23rd so quite clear there from the Sun saying that you know if you read the Sun vote to leave the EU Dan are you shocked by this that the Sun are backing Brexit um, well the Sun has always taken I think quite an anti-EU line so it's not really a surprise that they would go for this um, although they have kind of been reluctant to endorse yet um, they, they've taken this. a while haven't they yeah I think well a lot of the papers have I think the um, the Guardian endorsed straight away to remain and uh, of course the Express endorsed straight away to leave but I'm not sure that the Mail have endorsed yet definitively either way I think the papers have been like quite reluctant so I think this is a sign that the Sun is confident in leave I think. Okay, we've got a message in just very quickly. Uh, and my first threat of the afternoon from Barnaby Merrill says Henry needs to remember that Bible passage about glass houses and throwing stones. I don't want to know. Uh, moving on now to Charlie. Charlie, what do you think about the Sun endorsing Brexit? Do you think they honestly have real influence on how this referendum will go? I I think they do, and it, I think it's quite worrying because. I think obviously there is, there is the. I do think they'll be under the political pressure from from Murdoch um, to 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 advocate an anti stance. But also I think they they do try to represent some level their readership, and I think they've got a sense of of public opinion. And I think they're going with with a tight with sadly a groundswell that's starting to pick up for the Leave campaign. Mm, and it does seem in the last few days that there has been a distinctive shift that way. Emma and Gerard, you both work for a newspaper. <laughs> uh, what do you think? Do you think that newspapers really have a big sway as to how people vote, especially The Sun? I think, unfortunately, they do. They have a massive influence, and it's actually quite frightening because, obviously, The Sun has an incredibly large readership. Most of them do, and they often are politically motivated. But I, I feel like as soon as your media outlets which are supposed to be representative, are taking a specific stance. It's very worrying because in a time of quite a lot of uncertainty where um, I think the YouGov poll is saying that still 11% of people have no idea how they're going to vote. Um, But in a time when people are not sure how they're going to vote, 
it's it's difficult when you're being influenced by the people who are supposed yeah. to be giving you the facts. Because we were reading through the article before this, and we oh. were looking, and we were just saying that they're criticising the Remain campaign, saying, oh, it's fear-mongering when they're using the exact same tactics of saying things like, oh, this is, this is like, the, what, what was some of the stuff they were saying? In fact, make some notes. They were saying about how like, the EU is, like, bullying and vicious and dangerous, but that's exactly what our government is as well. I think we've got problems at home before mm. we start to... I think this is just all... I think it's... It's almost seems at this point to be blaming a wider issue with our own government on an external factor which can, can potentially be eliminated. Interesting. Jack, what do you think about that and, and the Sun's influence in general? Obviously, you know, one could argue that, you know, they endorsed the Tory government in the UK for the general election and they won. They endorsed the SNP in Scotland and they won. You know, whatever their motives were for that, they, they're, they're pretty influential, are they not? I think, you, like you say, you just have to look at the enormous readership of the Sun. It's, it, has, it has a circulation of like 1.6 million, something like that, and probably each paper is read by three or four people, plus the online readerships. And I think the other danger with the Sun is that because it's the sun, and this is a classic sort of sun headline, this one, they have a tendency because sort of their, they sort of, the, the 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 demographic that they're aiming for, they tend to simplify sort of things. So, uh, their, their arguments are very sort of one-sided. There's no sort of nuance to their arguments. And I think that's sort of dangerous in a campaign as complex as this. Interesting. Uh, Charlie, on, on that issue, just finally, so, do, so the Sun newspaper in general, do we think that newspapers should be allowed to endorse a particular side? Yeah, I don't see why not. Interesting. I Everyone, Gerard, both in favour of that? I mean, it's, I mm. I think it's up to interpretation. Will and the board like, be saying which way to vote? We will <laughs> not. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be... Uh, it would be devi- it would be divisive amongst us as well yeah. because obviously we all think differently. We all have different opinions, but at least from the and it depends on who's writing the article and if that's representative. Like mm. you obviously say with comment, like in during like the elections for SU and stuff, we're specifically told there are things you cannot you cannot report mm. on certain candidates and stuff for the reason of there needs to be a sort of sense of like unbiased. Mm. But I think personally, from being being able to. Um, do, give the okay on comment articles. I want, I I want there to be a, a good mix of sort of of people who are for, people who are against, people who just don't know. Yeah. Um, because it, it just helps people make their minds up. It's just yeah. incredibly. I important. think balance is more key rather than because if the sun come out with this as their sort of like okay believe in like that's them just basically saying that's who we're with. There's not real a real sort of balance there. It is mm. kind of and most people accept it as dogma. Like this article was literally backed up by such there weren't there was like one statistic which was like completely skewed it was like the 45 percent of under 25s in spain are unemployed and we're like okay well thanks for that is you gonna <laughs> like it just seems so irrelevant mm. Mm. we've had a few messages in I'll, I'll read out the ones that are appropriate uh one, one, <laughs> one uh, a message from f so i assume that's an anonymous says so much classism here lol so don't quite know what that is all about Ooh. but that it, that raises a good point that if you want to get involved in the conversation today please do tweet us at raw 1251 am or at Perspectives Raw. You can message our Facebook page, either Raw or Warwick Politics Society or Perspectives or whatever you want. Or if you're listening online, click the contact tab and there we go. Or if you're old fashioned and emails your thing, email studio at radio.warwick.ac.uk. Charlie, I was speaking to you then briefly. I just wanted to ask so, people who buy The Sun, do you think that someone who is undecided and perhaps buys The Sun will look at that and think, okay, the Sun now, you know, I'm dedicated Sun reader. They know I want me to support Brexit. I'm going to do that if you're undecided. Or do you think people who read The Sun, perhaps not all of them read it for, to, you know, to find out their politics? They, you know, might skip to the sports se- section or the lifestyle section mm-hmm. or the comments section. I think it's difficult to come up with, uh, with a hard and fast rule for this. But I, on the one hand, I do think that um, because you, you st- it, with it, like 10 days to go to the referendum, it's starting to get like a a strong tide now of lot of articles and media pieces coming out in favour of mm. Leave or Remain. And I think while this one issue may not do it, I think if it's a continual... If, if you're a Sun reader and this is continually uh, in the paper for the next 10 days, I, I think it definitely will sway, sway somebody's opinion. Jack, what do you think about that? Will it sway a, a large group of people's opinion? I think if the Sun now goes on a sort of very strong campaign for the next nine days, um, with sort of articles every day, front cover stories every day that are anti-EU, then 
especially if, if, if the main news source for a person is the sun, then th they're only really going to see that one side of the argument and therefore maybe that will have a significant impact on, on a number of people. Right, now we're going to move on to something a little bit different now and we're going to move, well actually not quite different, it's still on the subject of uh, journalism and this is the case of Owen Jones and let me just play you a little bit of what happened. That we've got uh, a warning or at least a call from, uh, just going to move it across, uh, a spokesman for Stonewall uh, saying that people would be feeling vulnerable yes. uh, and basically indicating Are you going to have security. an LGBT voice talking about it? Interesting. Oh. Sorry? Nothing. Carry on. Go on. Owen, seriously. I'm, I've I'm, had enough of this. Let me go. Okay. Owen, no genuinely. Way. We're trying to have a civilised conversation. I, don't have it. I, don't I know you're upset. You're upset. Yeah, I am. And you're I'm, very upset. I'm, I'm very quite upset. right. Everyone's upset and angry about this, but storming off a TV Sorry. set. Right, well, I but, think we'll continue we the press on? preview uh, yes. and say that... My name's Toby Young, and you're listening to Perspectives. So that was Owen Jones there walking off the set at Sky News after he was reviewing the papers with Julia Hartley Brewer, who is a well-known figure in the uh, industry of radio, he used to present on LBC and is now a presenter on talk radio, but is well-known for having a few controversial views. But uh, anyway, so Owen Jones walked off because he felt that the analysis of, of the situation uh, in Orlando didn't quite uh, focus enough on the subject of... That it was gay people that were deliberately targeted and uh, instead the focus seemed to be that whatever demographic these people were it was just an attack on western culture charlie do we think he was right to walk out of the interview i, I think so because the way that interview framed it was was almost deliberately ignoring the fact that this was a direct attack on on the queer community in america mm. and I'm, I'm really glad that owen jones stood up um and, and made that point Dan, should he have walked out, or do you think Owen Jones should have... Because, you know, he was a different voice on the panel. Should he have stayed and, you know, fought it out there and, and carried on? Well, I think you can see, like, both sides of the argument. I don't blame him at all, personally, for walking out. Because, okay. you know, uh, just after an uh, event like that, and you go on TV and you have people trying to make, you know, take political advantage mm. of it, I don't blame him at all for walking out, so... But do you think his objective would have been better met if, if he'd stayed there? I mean, obviously, it's full right to, to walk out, but if, he, if he'd stayed there and... Because Owen Jones is a very good speaker. Mm. If he'd stayed yeah. there and really uh, dug into the um, presenters... I think perhaps because there is... It's, you know, I think it's quite clear it was a homophobic attack. Mm. I think mm. even at that point it was, and it's increasingly clear. So I think that, yeah, he could have, you know, made that point more... Clearly okay. and forcefully. Gerard, what do we think about the whole situation with Owen Jones? Do you think he was right to walk out? You, well, yeah, you can see, I, like you said, I think it would have been good had he stayed, but actually he was outnumbered. The two of them framed it, like in the whole clip, you can see him saying uh, they're comparing. I understand that they were trying to compare it to like a wider thing of their Paris attacks and stuff, but this was specifically an attack on gay people. And if anyone, like, and not just like the LGBT community at large and like certain issues like trans issues and stuff aren't discussed enough. So I think to then just say, oh, this was a group of people, these were people having fun, they want to stop people having fun, like in Paris. It's like, I mean, you're not wrong, but it's, it's ignoring a major issue that definitely needs to be spoken about. And the two of them were, they just got quite fragile. But when he corrected them, all they had to say was actually, you're, that's an interesting take on it. We didn't, we haven't portrayed it like that. But instead, they, they immediately had their backs up and were like, oh, no, you're being oversensitive here. And it's literally like, well, no, it was important. OK, now, before we move on to a few more people, we've got a message in from Barnaby, who says, mainstream media have made it very binary. It can be both mm. an attack against Western culture and against LGBT people not that Sky News are known for their nuanced view what do we think about that Emma do we do we think that uh, you know that there was a clear problem that, that occurred in this situation and Owen Jones was right to walk out I actually completely agree with that viewpoint it's definitely um, it's it's definitely not a, 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 a an issue which is entirely based on the fact that it's a homophobic attack. It was without a doubt a homophobic attack and there's no way mm. of getting around that. But it also does have, it, it can expand into other discussions about things, about gun laws, about about the behaviour, about attitudes with Western civilization. But I think it's very damaging to see it as just one, especially mm -hmm. with this attitude which obviously Owen Jones led to Owen Jones leaving the set of Sky News. I I think that it's it's very difficult, but you do have to see it as a collective of issues which have come together, but not ignoring the fact that it was primarily an attack against the LGBT community. And I, th I think that I, looking at this interview, it goes deeper in, in, into how 
a lot when it comes to interviews in the media, there needs to be a lot more humility and uh, humility when it comes to panel members in listening to the voices of people who are from LGBT communities or uh, people of colour. When they say that this is when when they point out that something is being homophobic or you're failing to acknowledge that this is a homophobic attack. I mean, because when you look, when you watch that interview, the amount of times that Owen Jones gets talked over or his point of view dismissed, it's wrong. And I think people are too willing to, to talk over the voices of people who have been affected by this. And Jack, just finally on the issue, do you think Owen Jones's you know political statement of walking out uh, has will do anything to to make Sky News because this has obviously got a lot of coverage for the wrong reasons for Sky News. Do you think this will make them change their coverage on, on subsequent issues? I hope so because if you look at the interview, Charlie's absolutely right. They sort of they refuse to they they they, they acknowledge it's an attack against the Western world, but they don't. They, they seem to refuse to acknowledge that it's important to discuss the fact that the, the attack was against LGBT people. And um, hopefully, Sky have a, a issued an apology, but I do wonder whether the apology was down to pressure or whether they're actually um, looking to change what they do. Um, and okay. I don't think they will. On uh, the issue of the EU, which we discussed briefly with The Sun, we've had a load of messages in. Uh, firstly, a message from Karen, or Karen, it's spelled, says the EU is a bureaucratic nightmare, the blah, 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 social justice. Uh, no, no. However, the current Leave campaign requests a move towards xenophobic and, despite rhetoric about the NHS, will mean further dismantling of the protect protections and services people fought for so hard to get from the government and ruling classes. Thank you very much for your message in and a message from Tim who says, Gerard is spot on. The Sky dialogue, dialogue of trying to push it from an LGBT issue into a general one is really problematic. It's basically undermining the specific issues faced by people in that community and was said in an incredibly patronising way by JHB which is Julia Hartley Brewer. Uh, Barnaby Merrill says, is hetero Heterosplaining a thing. I don't know what that means. Oh, I know. Um, so it's basically like white. Well, I'm guessing it's kind of like white splain. So heterosplaining would be what the two pre Sky presenters were doing. Like, oh no, gay person, you don't understand. It's actually oh, an attack right. on the Western world. Like being patronising, basically. Um, okay, that's interesting. And a message in from Will. He says, worth remembering that it was a Latin that it was Latin night at Pulse meaning yes. that mm -hmm. vastly more POC were targeted. There is a racial element here uh, that has been overlooked in a lot of coverage. I didn't know Absolutely. about Absolutely. that. What do we think about that issue? Emma, I you think agreeing? it's... Uh, that also has to be taken into... It, there are so many factors to take into consideration. Mm. Um, it's... It, I mean, it, not, it was... It was. It could be considered to be a racist attack, could, rightly, because it was a Latin night at the club. It's an LGBT attack. It's an attack on Western civilization and Western attitudes towards the LGBT community. I think it's so much more than media is currently painting it to be. Mm. And I think it's quite dangerous to just have this one yeah. dialogue going on of oh my gosh it's an attack against the western that's world Trump, Trump's tweet that was like oh you're welcome I was right and it's like that's not strictly appropriate mm. right now mm. now's not the time to be right and actually because he's all about oh Islamist extremists terrorists all that and actually when he's failing to see there's actual issues in America going on that involve LGBT people involving people of colour still getting shot by the police every day and nobody's saying anything and the North Carolina the transgender bathroom situation these are all issues as well that are involved like these within like these attacks but Trump has taken, taken this to like support his own campaign of like basically demonising mm. people from Islam which is just it, wrong go on, it's Charlie. been deeply infuriating and sad, saddening as well to see um, incredibly homophobic American politicians come out and tweet about thoughts and prayers for, yeah. the, for the victims yet not acknowledging once that this, about the LGBT communities or that this was an attack in in a gay club and it is the rhetoric of, of so many politicians in the United States that creates this culture of homophobia mm. It's almost problematic the sort of power politicians now have with Twitter because after an incident like this, a lot of people, I'm not saying this was all your immediate thought, but it, it would have been in the, in the back of a lot of people's minds that, oh, I wonder what Donald Trump tweeted about this. Did he tweet something, you know, a little bit controversial? What did the right-wing Republicans tweet? You know, probably a load of nonsense, but that's what people uh, get drawn with their attention to. We will have to see. Uh, that was a nice discussion. Thank you very much for that. Got a bit feisty. Uh, worth, <laughs> worth mentioning that this Thursday at 8pm there is a vigil. Yes, would you like to tell us about that? Yes, yeah, so Warwick Pride are organising a vigil in remembrance of the Orlando um, massacre and other attacks on LGBT and, and the queer community throughout the world. Um, 
over re over recent months. So it will be um, Thursday at 8 p.m. on the campus, and there's a Facebook event. So please do come along and pay pay tributes. And finally, Charlie, I'll let you do a quick plug. How can people rate their module? WarwickSU.com forward slash rate. It's there quick, simple and anonymous. And you can do it on your phone, <laughs> can't you, as well? You can. You can do it on your phone. A couple more messages before we go to a quick song. Sam says, it's worth pointing out the victim has apparently been revealed as gay, which I didn't know. The, oh, the, was, not the victim, rather, the shooter. Uh, it's, assumed it's assumed that he was maybe a regular at the club and then he therefore could be uh, could be in the closet, could be a closeted homosexual. We, there's not much of a way I of knowing. I think he's that well, it was like debatable because they said, didn't they, something about he saw two gay men kissing and then decided to go on a rampage. But there's something mm. about his dad had said, yeah, I saw that. Actually, don't, yeah. don't, don't bother killing gay people because like God will punish them in the afterlife. So it's clear he obviously comes from a homophobic background fam so you, you don't know really it's no it's, it's there's no way of knowing at this point yeah, but mm. still. It's, it's all just yeah. rumors isn't it yeah. yeah and the final message is from dave he says calling the orlando attacks and uh, calling the orlando attacks an attack on western ideas is problematic the killer's ex-wife and father both say he wasn't particularly religious and doubt the attacks were religiously motivated mm. let's not forget mm. the western tradition of homophobic fundamentalist republicans who rail against lgbtq and latinx communities latinx latinx my name is uh, Sadiq Callum, I'm running to the Mayor of London, and you're listening to Raw. We're back on Perspectives, and coming up now, we will talk, be talking about the leave.eu tweet slash picture, which caused a lot of controversy yesterday. Uh, before I do that, make sure you get involved in the conversation. If you have any, you know, big opinions on the issues that we are discussing, tweet us at Perspectives Raw or at Raw 12.51am. Click the contact tab if you're listening online, or if you don't want to do any of that, you can email, e uh, which is studio at radio.warwick.ac.uk. So now our third topic is leave.eu, which is... One of the organisations that is trying to get the UK out of the EU. So that the official campaign is Vote Leave, which is headed by various people. You've also got a load of other campaigns, actually. You've got Grassroots Out, which is Farage and his clan. There's Labour Leave. There's, there's Tusk, the trade union and socialist coalition, that also apply to be the official campaign. But Leave.eu are one of those campaigns. And on their official account, which is Leave uh, EU Official, which is over 92,000 thousand followers uh, they there was an outrageous tweet that the free movement of Kalashnikovs in Europe helps terrorists and vote for greater security on June the 23rd vote hashtag leave but the image was the thing that caused a lot of controversy and it was obviously straight after these uh, Orlando attacks and it said Islamist extremism is a real threat to our way of life act now before we see an Orlando style atrocity here before too long this is outrageous isn't it Jack it I only just saw the tweet, but mm. I'm still sort of reeling from it. It's, luckily, I think that they have 92,000 followers on Twitter. I'm hoping at least 40,000. Not as many as Raw News. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping at least 40,000 of them are following it, ironically. I, they're, yeah. they're sort of irrelevant, but I mean, it's still shocking that it's been tweeted in this day and age. It is, rather. Dan, do you think uh, it's that shocking that this has been tweeted, given the campaign we have seen so far? I mean, we've had a lot of uh, talk about sort of, you know, racial, uh, playing up on racial hatreds during the London Mayor campaign. We've seen it a lot in the European uh, referendum campaign. Do, are we that shocked by what's come? Do we think Leave.eu were just, you know, thinking they can overstep the mark quite subtly? Yeah, I think Leave.eu, uh, we're going to see why they didn't get the official designation. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, to be the campaign here. But yeah, I mean, there, there was um, that, I forget her name, the Conservative MP who tweeted straight after the Brussels attack, something like... Yes, I forget who it was. Yeah, she was on Question Time, I forget her name. But she tweeted something like, uh, the EU can't even stop terrorism in their own capital, vote Brexit. Like, yeah. two or three That's hours. That's what I was saying earlier, the problem of politicians on Twitter. Um, it yeah. just doesn't work. Emma, what do we think about the whole tweet? I I mean, to be fair, more than anything else, it just seems like a, a, a really stellar example of, of something just not really being thought through very much before you tweet <laughs> it. Um, I think it was incredibly poorly timed, incredibly insensitive. And I'm just, I'm quite concerned that that's kind of the message that's getting out there. This it, It's insane fear-mongering, mm. which is exactly, as we said earlier, that's, that's often the argument about, for leave, but in in this instance, it's exactly what they're doing 
it, as a response. It makes no sense. Gerald, yeah. do you think the, the in campaign will be quite, not pleased about this, but sort of reaffirms their point? I mean, they've been talking about how Leave have been, you know, playing up on Rachel Hatred, you know, mm. using attacks like this. And they've just done that straight away. But I think as well, like the people, like people will be scared by this. Like this is a thing. Like we can look back and like we can see that this is actually really ridiculous and offensive. But a lot of people actually will see this and think, actually, yeah, we're we're safer than like if we're apart from all this. But actually, the the reality of it is, well, first of all, it's problematic using the Orlando style attacks because as we were just saying in the break, weren't we? It's debatable. Mm -hmm. It was actually the police officer that mm -hmm. said, oh yes, he said he did it in ISIS. So we have the police officer's report and American police. Not going to say anything, but you know. I mean, mm -hmm. like in terms of trustworthiness, this. So it's debatable whether or not the Orlando tax were in, you know, the name of ISIS or whatever, or Islamic extremism. So it's just wrong anyway. The, the very concept of the tweet. Yeah, I just, I just think like. Why? Like this, the, to me, this is just like you've taken something and just used it in a way that's totally irrelevant just to promote your fear mongering campaign. We've got a message in from Will Copping who says, Damn, I was half hoping the picture was fake. He says it's a new low, but still not surprising. And I think the panel here agree with you quite a bit, Will. Uh, <laughs> do we think that this age of Twitter in politics, and in particular the EU referendum, is going to keep producing things like this? I mean, it's not the first incident we've seen of controversial tweets and pictures. Hmm. Is it going to be the last, Gerard? No, definitely not. <laughs> I, I just, when Donald I, Trump's the president. Yeah, when yeah. Donald, well, I mean, I mean, you saw Donald Trump's the whole, the, you can thank me later thing, and then Hillary Clinton's like, delete your account, like all that. So it's, <laughs> I don't, I think that's whole thing about, but it's got us talking, hasn't it? So mm. like, that's the whole idea. So I don't think people are going to stop being less controversial on Twitter. I think it's just going to encourage it, really. Mm. Emma, I've got a question for you. Do you think they should be allowed to tweet this? I, I actually. I think they're they're entitled to have this platform. I I don't think that either side should have their platform taken away from them. But I think it's up for some sort of self, like just self reflective. Sit back and think we possibly <laughs> could have done that a bit better, and uh, and stop and stop just acting in the moment. I think I we I've been told things before. Is um, even on on just um, a journalism course they said you know don't be careful what you tweet because obviously it's out there, it's immediate, and you yeah. can you can you can easily regret things which you quickly just in 140 characters post on Twitter. <laughs> um, but I I think obviously they are entitled to their the use of this platform as are remain it's there's there's nothing this that is how people get the message across in today's world that's that's how you make an impact so you can't blame them for using twitter jack do you agree with emma but with something as controversial as what would tweeted so you, can other organizations if davy cameron wanted to could he tweet something you know <laughs> pr, you know something similar not think, in his position but as in as, as an individual with yeah, his freedom of speech rights i do agree because i think whilst twitter gives a platform to some of the most ridiculous things being said like like that leave.eu tweet it also gives a platform to people that otherwise will never get a platform because 20 years ago if you wanted to say something in public or get your message out there you had to somehow get onto a newspaper or have your opinion posted sort of um in like mm. newsletters and things like that and now people that before didn't have to have platforms now have a platform and that 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 can be a way to social justice i think is that quite good then dan quite a good idea by letting people tweet what they want on the issues um well but yeah official campaigns though like this not official campaigns, but you know campaigns that are officially set up by you know politicians business owners yeah well i would agree with the points you've made about freedom of speech rights but um one thing that i would note is that this isn't even like as well as being insensitive this isn't really true in an objective sense because obviously we're outside the schengen area so we don't have the free movement of mm. weapons in our area we do have security checks but i think the fact that twitter allows you to put out so much information makes um fact checking harder and that could lead to a need for a kind of uh, the electoral commission or whatever to be tougher on the kinds of messages that are put out and preventing these kind of objectively false Okay. Put out. With a few more messages in, one from Keon who says, if Leave campaigners want to stop terrorism, they need to stop alienating Muslim communities and bombing the, ne the Near East. Uh, racism and war, key uh, recruiting tools for terrorists. A message in from Don with a couple of expletives, but I'll try and uh, leave them out. Leaving the EU will something with devolution settlements, including the peace settlement, which constitutes the Northern Irish Legislative Assembly, as it 
and the ECHR are also part of the international agreement with Ireland. Will Copping has said Twitter is a thunderstorm of political discussion. Thank you very much, Will. Barnaby Merrill said daylight is the best filter. Once people have their bigoted opinions out in public, they can be crushed by the force of everyone's general disgust. <laughs> and OP <laughs> messages in, that might be a reference to Yik Yak actually, uh, says don't forget the power of protest to give the unheard voice over the rich who own the media and those with political power and influence. Do we agree with all those general points, do we think? That it gives other people who wouldn't be allowed in the general, not allowed in the general public, but heard in the general public their say. I think it's very important that when um, something like this is said, I wouldn't. I, I just. I would like to clarify that I don't. I don't believe that this specific. This should not have been posted. Mm. Absolutely, because it's it's just plain wrong, and it's it's very frightening for people who maybe. I mean, I I'm not going to claim that I know absolutely everything. I don't think everyone knows absolutely everything, and um, I think for for most people this could be quite terrifying um but i sort of think with with regards to the points that there there is a really solid argument for people being able to debate this you know people saw this and they immediately thought no that's wrong and the fact that the platform allows for that discussion to happen is really important Mm. Right, we're going to move on now to a song. We've got a couple more topics coming up. We have our infamous Perspectives quiz. We have an interview with former MP and former Raw presenter, which I didn't know, Dave Nellist, who was expelled from the Labour Party some years back, but is now the National Chair of the Trade Union and Socialist Coalition. And we'll also touch on Sadiq Khan, who wants to ban body-shaming adverts. My name's Sean Berry, Green Party candidate for Mayor, and you're listening to Raw. Our next topic of conversation concerns the new Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. And uh, there was this sort of saga, I'm tempted to call it, a while ago, mm. about the adverts on the tube, and it was the title said, "Are you beach body ready?" And it was um, it was an advert for protein shakes, apparently, and it was about weight loss. And there was a blonde female with a yellow bikini and background, which was part of a debate last year as to whether these adverts should be allowed. Sadiq Khan said he wants to ban these adverts, which he calls body shaming, and says, "As the father of two teenage girls, I am extremely concerned about this kind of advertising, which can demean people, particularly." women and make them ashamed of their bodies it is high control it's high time it came to an end and also says nobody should feel pressurized while they travel on the tube or bus into unrealistic expectations surrounding their bodies and i want to see, send a clear message to the advertising industry about this this sort of comes under the the bracket of freedom of speech in a way in the terms of you know freedom of advertising should we be allowed to have adverts like this dependent on what message it sends out firstly gerard do we think do we agree with Sadiq Khan that this advert sends out the wrong messages? Yes. Well, because if you look at the advert, it is like, it's not saying that, like, we should be like, yes. Well, basically, it's a skinny blonde woman who's white. And obviously, not everybody looks like that. And not every not everybody can look that thin without, mm. like, ex- insane amounts of work. Some people naturally are that Say thin. Say it if you want. I know I can't look <laughs> that thin. But, <laughs> <laughs> but some, like, people are all of, all of sort of, like, different size, and, like, some people can be that thin healthy, some yeah. people can't be, like, the, and the whole thing is it's saying, like, this is what you should look like. So, really, I don't... I think there needs to be more diversity in advertising full stop, because if you constantly get, like, Eurocentric beauty standards are such a mad thing where you see, like, thin, blonde, white women, and if that's what you're aspiring to, if you don't look like that, especially for women I think as like boys and stuff we obviously don't get as much I think it's obviously Emma you could probably talk about that how like the body standards for women are just it will just make you feel crap if you constantly see something you're not well I think um, sorry just part, uh, apart from the fact that I'm now picturing Henry in a yellow bikini <laughs> sorry and, sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry if you're trying to eat your lunch or something oh, or yeah. <laughs> sorry guys <laughs> okay, um, yeah. but I, I think that it is incredibly important I'm, I'm really glad that Sadiq Khan has taken a stand on this I also think that a alongside unrealistic expectations of women because I've I say to people all the time that even if I lost weight I would never be able to look like that I am not an overweight person but I could never look the way that a lot of the women in adverts look because my body is not built that way not many people are built that way it's genetic Mm. but at the end of the day I think you've got to stop making people believe that if they you know, if if they take this protein shake, if they drink this protein shake every day, then they could have this woman's body. Because quite frankly, it's not realistic. Yeah, that's not what it looks like. And it's and not sort of the, the emblem of being healthy yeah. either. Or, no one. Or it, thin. it leads to really unhealthy. Sp- 
ways of thinking. It leads to, mm. you know, I've, I, I've, I've known quite a few people who've suffered with eating disorders in the past, and things like this are just a knock back. You don't, you can't look at that objectively when you're in the clutches of these unhealthy, these unhealthy brain patterns of mm. thinking. And I think that I would, I would extend it as well to say that this, this shouldn't be the expectation of men either. I feel like mm. where you've got protein supplements, there are a lot of. I think people were outraged by the fact that it was a picture of a, sk- of a skinny blonde woman um but i also think people should be outraged by the fact that there's always a ripped guy on these adverts as well that there's always <laughs> this guy with like chiseled abs a proper adonis that's not realistic for a lot of people jack can we see you doing that then when you uh, graduate from work or if you graduate from work rather than not. These <laughs> i don't think i have that kind of body um i'll give you two just the final few words before we move on to our perspectives quiz sorry it's rushed dan do you think this should be allowed um, I'm not like that concerned about the freedom of speech aspect with uh, regards to advertising, but I do think that this is more of kind of a PR move. I don't think it's going to make a massive uh, impact. I so, it's, so is it just Sadiq trying to score a few points? Do you think? I think it is, yeah, because I think a lot of these kind of body images are driven by people's like views in the wider societal context, and the advertising comes from that rather than. Uh, driving it like from nothing. Okay, and Jack, finally? Personally, I feel like this kind of advertising sort of promotes the skewed body image that we uh, body image that we have and what we think is normal. And I agree, that, that it's the same for men, but I feel like there's probably more pressure on women to look the way that many adverts show. Um, I'm a little bit conflicted on whether it should be banned because yeah. sort of freedom of speech or not. But then I feel like oh, the unhealthy of speech, ah. <laughs> the unhealthy views <laughs> that it sort of promotes could be sort of put in the same category as us banning smoking or something like that. I'm not sure. Thank you very much, Jack. That's a nice uh, different perspectives on it. Uh, talking of perspectives, it's now time for the perspectives quiz. That didn't go as well. My name's Dave Dallas, and you're now to listen to the perspectives quiz. Right, so we've got a few questions on this week. I hope you're all looking forward to it. The, I'll split you up into two teams. We'll have the boar versus the non boar yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The minority. Same old. Uh, yeah. Right, the first question. And if you want to answer the question, just shout. So, not not obviously that loudly. Which famous comedian who is... Oh, and these are quite obscure questions, so sorry if you don't get it. Which famous comedian who is a big-name supporter of a pro-Europe party has come out in support of, support of Brexit in the last two days? Ooh, Anyone got the answer? Is it not Russ? No. Mm. It's not John Cleese, is it? It is oh, John Cleese. Oh, Reeves, that's impressive. Who is <laughs> the most well-known <laughs> Lib Dem supporters come out in support of leave. Yeah. Next question. What was the name of the former owner of BHS, who's in the news quite a lot? Dominic Chappelle or Philip Green? Philip Green oh, I feel like we're is not correct. Very Sorry, the board is getting destroyed. Day by day. <laughs> Next question. Uh, where did Gordon Brown film his short clip about staying in the EU? Oh, oh yeah. Coventry Cathedral. It was indeed. Yes. The options you were going to be given were in the bread oven, in his back garden, in the EU Parliament, or Coventry. Oh, it should have been the bread oven. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it could have resonated more. Uh, now, next question. What was the name of the Conservative MP who was previously for leave, but is now backing Remain in the last few days? Sarah Waterston. Sarah, yeah, Sarah Waterston. Correct. I was going to say Judy something, so I'm quite <laughs> glad I didn't say anything. Last two questions. This is quite an obscure one. Alex Polizzi, apparently is a TV presenter. Uh, I hadn't heard of her. Uh, the EU, what did she say about the EU? Did she say the EU campaign is worse than student politics, no one cared about the EU before the referendum, or the EU is like a badly run hotel? Anyone got any ideas? Is it no one cared? Yeah. Hmm. Oh. Is it the student oh. politics one? Not. I hope it is. Student politics one? No, no sorry, the you're wrong. Mom. It was okay. the best. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Point. Um, Yay! And the last question is, which famous anti-monarchist politician uh, actually made the Queen a cake for her 90th birthday? It's John McDonnell. John McDonnell is correct, who is pretty anti-monarchy, but... Bake the Queen a nice little yeah. cake for a birthday. I was quite hoping PR, it would be Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. So I can imagine him like, with his little oven gloves. <laughs> that would be brilliant. And now we have a final message to finish off the show before we get interviewed. Before we interview, rather, Dave Nellist, who says, You know capitalism is a joke when you pay £1.30 for a bottle of water out of a vending machine and it comes out tepid and strange tasting. Mm. Yet it's raining outside. Poignant. Talk about false scarcity. Right. Thank you very much, everyone, for being on the show this week. Thanks to Gerard. Thanks to Emma. Thanks Thanks to Jack, thanks to Dan, and thanks to Charlie Hindhoff. And don't forget to rate your module if you get a chance. It's all been good fun, but now here is the interview with Dave Nellist. 
joined here now by Dave Nellis, who is the National Chair of the Trade Union and Socialist Coalition. Dave, firstly, you're at Warwick speaking about the EU debate. Why do you want to leave? Well, I think since its inception and increasingly over the last 25 years, the EU stands for the Employers' Union. It's a construct which favours big business, um, and in its uh, treaties and its uh, directives, it's uh, eating away at public ownership, it's promoting privatisation, liberalisation, marketisation of essential services in transport, in energy, in water, postal services and, uh, and other things. And I want to see uh, a, a new Europe. I'm in favour of internationalism. I want one where working people can cooperate in a socialist uh, way and basic public industries can be publicly owned. The EU is an obstacle to that. But do you think that if we were to leave on the 23rd of June, I mean, it was something that was spoken about briefly tonight, that would be a Europe that favours right-wing interests? I mean, obviously you come at it from a left-wing perspective. Do you think that we'd, we'd just have restrictions on immigration? I think, regretfully, politics in certain parts of Europe is moving in that direction already. Look at Austria, look at Hungary, look at the prospect of Le Pen winning the presidency in, uh, in France. For those who say staying in the EU is for all for harmony, sweetness and light, they've got to look at the way in which those uh, particular potential changes could take place to the heads of government. And it's the 28 heads of government, all of whom are pro-capitalist, pro-market. Uh, 19 of the 28 are within the uh, equivalent of the Tory party in terms of constructs within the European uh, Parliament. Some are worse than the Tory party, as I've uh, already uh, mentioned. So staying within the EU in a, a, an organisation which is designed to strengthen the, uh, the control of capitalism over the whole of the, the continent, it's just allowing factorism to be writ on a continental scale. Do you feel honestly let down or betrayed by Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell? You were a long-term sort of friend of Corbyn and political ally. You come at the same political spectrum and he had a really good opportunity, you perhaps argue, to really change the discourse on this particular debate. Well, Jeremy and I were elected in 83 on a Labour Party manifesto against the EC and we've held those views, my case uh, still today. Jeremy, even in the summer when he was campaigning to be Labour leader, was doing meetings around the country mm. where when he's asked the question about David Cameron renegotiations, he at least had the position of let's see what Cameron comes back with and if that impacts on working people, their families and their uh, union rights and so on then Labour will still be against it. Unfortunately within uh, about 10 days of him being uh, elected in September of last year he signed this Faustian pact with Hillary uh, Benn in order to preserve Hillary Benn and some of the right wingers within the shadow uh, cabinet and promised to uh, become second fiddle in, in David Cameron's orchestra when it came to the, the referendum and I think there's a big chance being missed. I can see on the 23rd of June, either a leave vote or a close remain vote, David Cameron being toast that night, fractions uh, uh, within the Tory party uh, erupting into open uh, warfare, uh, a unified Labour and trade union movement was arguing for leave and against the Tories could take advantage of that and demand not just a change of Tory leader but a general election to change the government. So in that sense I think Jeremy and John have missed a golden opportunity to take their brand of politics forward in this country. You, you describe yourself in the debate as an internationalist and socialist. Um, one of the key arguments for Remain is, you know, we can't be internationalist if we uh, leave the EU. How would you see sort of British internationalism if we were to leave the EU? Well, I made the point in the uh, debate that uh, when it comes to things like human rights, which are governed by the Council of Europe, that's a body of uh, uh, 47 countries, not the 28 of the European Union. When it comes to playing football in Europe, UEFA is 57 countries, not the 27 of the EU. When it comes to the Eurovision Song Contest, it's 52 countries, including Israel and Australia, which stretch to the boundaries of uh, Europe quite a, a distance. It's not the 28 of the EU. In other words, in all sorts of different aspects of life, there are ways of organising on an international and a European scale, not through the narrow confines of the politics and the economics of the EU itself. I would want Britain leaving on the 23rd, then engaging through trade unions and socialist campaigns. Let's give a just off the cuff an immediate uh, suggestion for a a uh, European-wide £10 an hour uh, minimum wage. Because if people weren't forced to flee from low-paying uh, countries, particularly in former Eastern uh, uh, Europe, to the countries of, of Germany and, uh, and Britain because of the disparity of, uh, of wages, they could perhaps choose to live and love where their families are without having to leave their families to, to seek work. So let's have the sort of Europe that 
lifts wages and lifts everybody's living standards, not just makes big profits of big corporations. And that's not possible in the EU. It's unreformable in that sense. Oh, absolutely. To yeah. change a treaty, you need the unanimous vote of 28 heads of uh, government. As I said, the vast majority of vote, and not just Tories or pro-capitalists. Some of them are even worse than that. I see no prospect of democratic change within the uh, uh, EU, but I do see the possibility on June the 23rd, if we vote uh, no, we could shape a new government in this uh, country and a new form of internationalism. Just a few more questions. Um, Tusk, you're obviously the national chair, um, and they, you know, they did field a lot of candidates in the 2015 election. Where I am in Kingston, we had a candidate called Laurel Fogarty who stood. Uh, did you realistically think that they were going to be the main uh, opposition to the EU? Because I know you applied to be the official campaign. Uh, no, we, we, we stood um, 750 candidates in the uh, 2015 election, over 600 for the councils and uh, about 130 for uh, Parliament. We're the sixth largest uh, party that you've never heard of in those elections. Uh, and that's because we got so little uh, uh, coverage. We, we, we stood uh, uh, hundreds of candidates in the council elections this year. Um, and the only debate that took place on the local BBC radio, Radio CWR, was for 30 minutes, five days days before the uh, uh, election. So socialist anti-austerity candidates, even with relatively large numbers of uh, you know, 10 to 15 percent of the national uh, total, still don't get those arguments uh, coming across. And that obviously has an impact when it comes to elections. But uh, we did get anti-austerity councils elected in places like uh, Southampton. We came close in uh, in, uh, in, in, in parts of the, the north uh, west. We've got loads of uh, towns and cities where we were getting two, three thousand votes. Uh, it's, it's something to build on, but uh, no, at the moment, we, we, we're, we, we're, we're quite clear and modest where we, uh, we are. We stand in large numbers of uh, candidates, but we're averaging about 35 4% of the poll. And what have you thought about the nature of the debate? I mean, obviously, it's been quite egotistically driven, some would argue. I mean, you, the side you advocate has really been driven by Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage, which I imagine you're quite dismayed at. What have you thought about that? Well, well Tusk applied to the Electoral Commission to be the main Leave campaign, or if we weren't acceptable as that, that, be, that we put strong arguments for there to be no Leave campaign uh, uh, chosen. Because the differences between Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson and their uh, uh, supporters were, were, were uh, relatively uh, minor, and the agenda between what has uh, emerged as the Remain and Leave uh, campaigns on such things as austerity, on such things as public ownership, doesn't allow the sort of debate that would have happened had there been an independent working class and socialist uh, alternative. But we, we stood that because we didn't want the debate to be uh, diverted down the road that Nigel Farage and, and Boris Johnson uh, have taken it, particularly on the question of, uh, of migration and the racism that has come about because of that. And just finally, uh, do you think we should have a general election? Election after this EU referendum. It's something you touched on briefly in the debate. Um, obviously, if, if it's a very close vote, you, are, you would argue that a general election is necessary, would you? If it's a very close vote, I think Debbie Cameron will uh, go. There could well be some either resignations, by-elections or defections of uh, Tory MPs. They've only got a 12-seat uh, majority. Uh, I think Jeremy uh, uh, Corbyn and the Labour and Trade Union movement should be demanding, not just on the 24th of June that there is a change in the leader of the Tory party, whether it's a, a vote for leave or a close remain main vote, but actually uh, recognising the fact that on a 24% uh, of, of the popular uh, turnout, this Tory government does not represent the majority of the, uh, the country, and on an issue that's uh, engaged people in the way this now has en engaged people, on the 24th of June, I think it's right we should be talking about a general election and a realignment of parliamentary representatives more in line with where people are thinking about politics now, not how they were thinking about uh, politics a couple of years ago. And would you be prepared to sort of an unofficial alliance with Jeremy Corbyn? I, I I don't think there's any uh, prospect of me as an individual ever being <laughs> admitted to a member of the Labour Party because Jeremy doesn't run the Labour Party. Yeah. You know, he's got about a dozen mates in uh, Parliament and a couple of hundred uh, Labour MPs are against him. And the machinery up and down the country. So, for example, in Coventry, uh, the cuts that were uh, implemented by the Labour uh, Council were exactly in line with previous uh, uh, years. There was no change whatsoever just because Jeremy had been elected as, uh, as, as leader. But a working arrangement, I've, I've actually uh, uh, tried to put this forward, that Labour itself was found. 116 years ago as a federal uh, coming together of different social societies and the trade uh, unions and that could be a model for the uh, the future. It's a model that actually Tony Benn tried to put forward in the 1980s of socialists inside and outside the Labour Party cooperating and I'd well uh, uh, be prepared to discuss with Tusk 
cooperating with Labour. We wrote to every Labour candidate standing for election, the May election, saying if you're uh, against austerity, you want to fight the cuts, we will support you. We won't put up candidates against you. We will help in that uh, battle. However, if you're just going to bend the knee and carry out another few million cuts in, uh, in, in youth facilities, in libraries, in adult social uh, care, then we will put anti-austerity candidates against you. That's a sort of cooperation that uh, I'm more than happy to, uh, to discuss. If there's a fight taking place on Labour, socialists outside Labour would want to support that. But if Labour's carry on the same old austerity, they're going to be opposed. Thank you very much for joining me today. My name's Dave Nelliston. You're listening to Raw.